When you're in full flight, it's as if the words are struggling to keep up with the brain. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, Oliver Sacks says it's like voluntary Tourette's. <laughs> well, I'd like to I'll come back to Oliver Sacks a little bit later, but, but I assume that there has to be a serious discipline uh, behind the free flow. Or, totally, or, yeah. Or is it do. always just a high wire act? No, no. I mean, the, you, you do have things kind of in the back of your mind, but sometimes you'll get like broken field running where there'll be an opportunity to talk about something and you'll go off on it. I mean, occasionally somebody will say something or there'll be something new and you'll find, you know, a new, a new idea. But, yeah, there is behind it, there's thought and preparation and, you know, ideas to say, okay, and, but you work them out on stage. You find out pretty quickly what works or what doesn't work. And sometimes the thing is to take the courage to say, oh, this may not be working here, but hold on, it might be working later on. Like the idea of, a, I tried it once on stage of a... Mort Saul, I talked to him today, and he was talking about America as, about to, as a country looks like it's going to go into rehab soon. And I thought there'd be a, a, a rehab for old, uh, for em, call it empires. When, you know, you come in, hello, <laughs> feeling like you used to be top of the world, somewhat not empowered anymore, powerless, really. Come on in. Come on, don't be afraid. These are the French. Hello, we want to it all. <laughs> but now we win the uh, Melbourne Cup, and we try to do all this crazy thing, and we, now we make great food. The Italians, the Russians, don't ask. We are working slowly through all of our problems. You forgot the English. Oh, yeah. hello. <laughs> you used to have everything. Now we're just basically horribly literate, <laughs> incredibly intellectual and bitter about certain things, but moving on, moving through. God bless us all. You're not easy on yourself in this show, are you? No. You know, as an alcoholic, I talk about, you know, some warning signs, you know, like DUIs in a cul-de-sac, things like that. The idea of, you know, have you been through it to talk about it and see, like, you know, this is what you go through. Heart surgery, you know, alcoholism. I went to rehab in wine country just to keep my options open. And the idea of, you know, these are things you got to talk about. Well, you had you, you got your own vineyard. Ah, uh, yes, that's like Gandhi owning a delicatessen. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? This is not for my consumption. So you were dry for 20 years. Yes. Why did you fall off? Uh, I was in a little town in Alaska. It wasn't the end of the world, but you can see it from there. And it was like all of a sudden I thought, I could drink. It's also that same thought you have if you look off a large building and go, I can fly. Mm. And within a week it was like, gone, you know. And now, you know, I realize I can't. So that was the gift, you know. How, um, how vividly can you remember falling into the trap in the first place with, with cocaine and alcohol? Because I don't vividly remember anything from that. <laughs> It's like there is this thing for alcoholics called a blackout, which isn't really a blackout. It's more like sleepwalking with activities. And I believe it's your conscience going into a witness protection program, going, you're about to have sex with a hobbit. I've got to go now. Good luck. I'm checking out. I'm leaving the body on, but we're not going to remember anything. Good luck to you. Take care. But do you remember getting into it? Getting into it? No. Was I remember it a gradual that, thing? Or? Yeah, it was very gradual. It was just, <laughs> and you're off, you know, oh, yes. you're off yeah. and running. And then the alcohol kicked in and decided, and then eventually you realized, I can't, I, I remember stopping it on my own because I was about to have a son. And I didn't want to be coked up going, hey, dad loves you. Here's a little switch. I'm going to throw up on you. You know, you don't want to be like that. And I had to kind of go, Psst. but I did it alone. So that was why it was, you know, 20 years without any help. Of course, there are people who would say, why did you ever need cocaine? You, you're, yeah, it's a bit redundant. You're, you're, as, you're as fast without it as, as, totally. the, as the heaviest cocaine addict would yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, it's that weird thing. I think I did it because it would, it would actually allow me not to talk. It was like, you know, reverse medication. You know, why they give Ritalin to hyperactive children is that idea of kind of, oh, okay, I don't have to talk to people. It, just, it kind of shuts you down, hmm. which is, a, you know, word self-medication. And I've read that your friend uh, John Belushi's death... Uh, yeah. from, from an overdose was that scares you. A, a bit of a rude shock for you. Totally. And that, but, but more importantly, my son. I think that was the beginning of kind of, you know, thinking outside the box of you've got a responsibility and it's more than you. How hard was it to break the grip the second time around? Um, not hard once you go to rehab. I mean, really? rehab is, yeah, that's the beginning of kind of, you know, um, the idea is you've got to surrender. You've got to just say, I can't do it because, you know, I went to rehab with a lot of doctors and psychiatrists. I mean, the, the more intelligent you think you are, the harder it is to let go. You think, I've got a solution. I'll just drink a little bit. It's like saying, I'll just partially circumcise myself. I'll be fine. Mm. And, and then you have to go, nope, you lose. You can't do it. You need help. And at that point, that's the beginning. And then, you know, once you do that, you're out and run. The world has come to see you as a, as a brilliantly high-octane uh, comedian who tried his hand at acting, but you actually trained as an actor first at Juilliard. Totally. In New York. 
Is one a passion more than the other, or do they go hand in glove? Both they feed each other. I mean, the yeah. comedy forces you to deal with fear and the idea of putting yourself out there. And the acting is more like uh, going within and finding all the different parts of, you know, a character. And especially when you're playing the really dark, strange characters like in One Hour Photo, where you get to explore behavior that you do prison time for. Mm. You know, it's that idea of you're playing a killer, really. <laughs> and part of your brain's going, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. And that's, but that's the joy of acting, where you get to explore all sorts of different, you know, all those, you know, aspects of human behavior. And then you could take that back to the comedy in terms of the concentration. So they feed each other. They're symbiotic. Can we uh, talk briefly about some of the people who've, who've influenced your work or whose work you, you really enjoy? For instance, I saw you with Jonathan Winters on, oh David, God. Yeah. on David Letterman. There was clearly a very strong bond there. Oh, he's the best. He's a wonderful friend, and he just had heart surgery, and he's doing great. He had two stints put in, and I called him. I said, John, how are you? Ah, ah, I had an operation performed by Japanese surgeons. It was cheaper, but I told them I was in the war. They weren't pleased. <laughs> and um, I, whenever I talk to him, it's really wonderful. He's the best. He's, uh, for me, he's the, he's the Buddha. He is the, uh, my, you know, the teacher, very powerful influence. Who are the actors you've enjoyed? I, I, oh my I, God, working with, um, this is a weird thing. I, uh, I got to, Marlon Brando taught an acting class, very briefly, and I got to take it. I mean, he said, you know, if you come in here, it's gonna be crazy. I don't know what I'll say because you have me laughing so much. <laughs> At one point his dog was basically licking his ass. He went, wouldn't that be a great behavior to see on a film? <laughs> I went, wow, if you're that flexible, way to go. But it's, you know, of the actors I've worked with, oh, Max von Sydow, Walter Matthau, all of them. It's been great, mm. you know. I mean, you just walk away from the experience. I mean, the boys in Goodwill Hunting, and they are boys. I mean, you know, both of them, Matt and Ben. It was an incredible experience. And you, you walk away, there's been no movie that I've walked away from, even the ones that didn't do well, where you don't go, I learned a lot, you know. You, what, you, what about Dead Powered Society with, oh uh, my with, God. with Peter Weir? One of the greatest experiences. It was incredible. It was the true learning experience because Peter's more than a director. He's a teacher. I don't know anybody who's worked with him that comes away going, well, that was nice. You come away a different person. He, he, he infuses you. Like when, when we were doing that movie, he gave us poetry. He gave us music. He played music during takes. That would just get you into this incredible spirit and very inspiring. I remember when the, the boys stood on their desk. I was going, this is very powerful. And I looked over and I saw a teamster crying and I went, Okay, this is really working. <laughs> Ravel is crazy. I don't know why. The boys on the desk is giving me crazy. But it was, in a, you know, this inspirational movie where it's the first time I did a film where people were touched beyond the movie, where they want to change their lives, and I hope for the better. To be many people said they became teachers, I went, oh, good luck, especially picking that profession in America, where you know that's going to be really, you have to be dedicated to be that. Is there anything you can't find something funny in? Is there any no-go area for you? I don't know. You'll find it when, when you do. You'll know the moment you do it, and I don't want to explore that most of the time. It so. hasn't happened yet? Um, there'll be things where you might get someone, you know, you'll say something and people go, oh, and you go, you know, you don't want to really... I'm not out to, uh, you know, uh, to attack people in that sense, but you want to talk about things, but sometimes you go, there will be people offended or hurt by and you will go, okay, I've said it, you know, and you have to go in the process of doing comedy. Not everyone will find it funny. Well, you did offend Kevin Rudd. Yes, but, I did. But and that was by accident. It was weird. I was trying to talk about, you know, the Australian accent and saying it's a combination of English and, and I used the word redneck and I went, oh, and then the moment I went, okay, good old boy. Or I can say Welsh samurai. But the idea that all of a sudden I offended the Prime Minister of Australia and the next day he offended the Governor of Alabama when he said perhaps Mr. Williams should spend some time in Alabama before he calls someone a redneck, cut to the Governor of Alabama saying perhaps the Prime Minister should spend some time in Alabama before he realizes that we're, you know, decent, hardworking people. Now I've created a linguistic war between 
two accents that people are going to have trouble. I'll tell you right now. No, right now. Let me tell you right now. No, <laughs> coming after you. And meanwhile, the Navajo code talker is going, I will talk to them to try and bring them back to a place of peace. <laughs> Kevin will, he meant no offense. It was mainly linguistic. Well, Kevin Rudd is no longer prime minister. I know. He's gone away. Well, he's still around. He's, he's still around. He's foreign minister. <laughs> is he really? Mm hmm Congrats. Good job, Kev. You've got so much success behind you. Is there anything left undone? Susan Boyle. I was, oh, right. Susan Boyle on ice. No. <laughs> People said when they said that who would play her in the movie, they went, me. I went, oh, no, no, please. That's taking Mrs. Doubtfire way too far. I don't know what's left to do. I'm doing a play on Broadway in the spring, so that'll be interesting. You know, this it's a very weird piece called The Bengal Tiger in the Baghdad Zoo. That'll be, that'll be a discipline. That'll be eight shows a week. So what drove that decision? A really interesting play, kind of talking about the war in Iraq and about pretty much everything. It's a bit like Godot in Iraq, which sounds like, what? But I think it'll be, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an easy play, but I don't do things easy. And how's your health now? How's the heart? Good. The heart is good. The bovine valve works. You know? It's nice. I give a great quart of cream. <laughs> People go, what does that mean? Stop. Not in nice. Don't go there. Robin Williams, thanks very much. You're for welcome, boss. Thanks.